let's talk about the pancreas before we talk about neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. Uh, where is the pancreas? Well, as you can see, the pancreas sits behind the stomach, under the liver, and behind part of the colon. So it's kind of an area where, as a surgery uh, resident, we were always taught, you know, don't go too close to the pancreas. It's an angry organ, and it's not going to like that you get operated, uh, uh, that it gets like <laughs> operated on. And, and it's actually true, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But nevertheless, when we have tumors that uh, uh, start in the pancreas, uh, we do want to do uh, surgery on them in most cases. So what does the pancreas do? The pancreas has two very important functions. The first function is it secretes uh, juices that help you digest food. And the second uh, important function is that it actually secretes hormones, such as insulin, for example, that, have, uh, that help you regulate your metabolism. These hormones get secreted in this tiny little uh, islands uh, that are uh, basically are distributed within the entire organ, and that's where the neuroendocrine tumor cells come from. So when we talk about adenocarcinoma, or classic cancer of the pancreas, that's not neuroendocrine. Those come out of the rest of the pancreas. Neuroendocrine uh, tumors come really out of these small little islets that produce these hormones. So uh, peanuts are relatively uh, rare if you look at all uh, malignancies uh, from the pancreas. It's 5 to 10 percent of all of the pancreatic malignancies. As I said before, they do come from these islets of Langerhans. And um, uh, they represent about 7 percent of newly diagnosed nets. And as Thor said before, those are tumors that are more and more common. Um, so it's about 3.3 per million per year. Um, and that curve is the same curve that uh, Thor showed, uh, showed before. So uh, we are detecting more and more of these tumors, um, probably due to the fact that there's uh, better scans um, and patients get more scans. Now, um, interestingly, I told you just 30 seconds ago that uh, these tumors come from the uh, hormone-producing cells of the pancreas, but about 85% of them actually do not secrete hormones. And we don't really quite understand biologically why that is, but the, the matter of the fact is that a majority of them do not secrete hormones. And two famous people that uh, unfortunately passed from peanuts, Steve Jobs and um, Aretha Franklin. So um, the prognosis, as Thor said before, is dependent on a lot of things, including um, the stage, of course, that you are in. So whether you are stage one, you have a stage one peanut or a stage four peanut makes a big difference. The grade makes a big difference, as I said before as well. But if you look at, and that's, excuse me, if you look at um, over there, the, uh, the blue part of the uh, pie there shows that about 40% of patients that are diagnosed with a peanut uh, uh, present with liver metastases. And that's an important thing to know. Um, and we will talk about how to treat liver metastases a little bit later in the day. So I'm not going to go too much uh, into details about that today. So Thor went over this, so I'm not going to go over this. This is actually the old classification, the 2010 classifications. But for simplicity purposes, the great matters, as we know, low KI-67, and most peanuts are low KI-67, but some are high-grade uh, tumors with, uh, with a high KI-67. And it, it does affect a little bit our consideration on where we, uh, whether we would do surgery, whether we have a low-grade or high-grade. Um, um, but, but I would say that regardless, if it's localized, if it's a stage one, two, or three, uh, you should probably have an operation even if uh, uh, it's a high grade, but you, you want to make sure that it has not uh, spread somewhere else if it's a high grade. So that's an important message, and I want you to remember that, that surgery is actually the only potential curative option for localized pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. We don't have any drugs that can cure peanuts when they are only limited to the pancreas. We got to do the old school of just cut it out. Now, that is the pancreas again, as I showed you before. It's the yellow organ there. You can see the bile duct with the gallbladder right there. And then the first part of the intestine, which we call the duodenum. So I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about, as a surgeon, what do we consider um, when we see a patient that is newly diagnosed with a peanut? So we consider the location of the tumor and the size of the tumor. So if you have a tumor that's in the head of the pancreas, and it sits right on what's called the pancreatic duct, which is the duct that secretes the juices 
in the intestine or the bile duct that goes through part of the pancreas and secretes uh, the, bile, uh, uh, the bile in the intestine, that's something that we obviously need to remove with what's called a Whipple surgery or Whipple operation. And I'll talk to you about that in a few minutes. So that's a big operation where we remove the head of the pancreas. If we have a tumor, though, that sits, whether it's in the head, the body, or the tail of the pancreas, um, but it sits away from these structures, and it's small, we don't always have to remove a big chunk of the pancreas. Very often, we can carve these tumors out. And this is unique to neuroendocrine tumors. You cannot do that with an adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, but you can do that with neuroendocrine with nets, and that's what we call enucleations. Now, if you have a tumor like that that sits, that's small in size, but sits right on the duct again, that's a problem. We're probably going to have to remove part of the pancreas, body, and tail, because if the tumor sits on the duct um, and we try to carve it out, we're just going to put a hole in the duct and it's going to leak forever and it's not a good outcome uh, long term. So, if you could go to uh, the the video, um, to start playing and put it on second 54. So don't just play. So play first. Play. P push the play button. Yeah, and then go to second 54. 54, 54. You using both traditional open and Good. robot assistance. Go ahead, technique. 53. The plenary T. We actually try to practice. Determine if the Whipple is right for there them. There we go. So let, let it be. During right. the procedure, so the surgical team removes the head of the pancreas. Then they remove the first portion of the small intestine, or duodenum, gallbladder, part of the bile duct, and nearby lymph nodes. In some cases, a small part of the stomach and portions of the nearby artery and vein may also need to be removed. So that's a Whipple operation. That's the biggest sort of pancreatic operation that we do. And as, I, as it was shown in the videos, we remove the head of the pancreas, part of the intestine, part of the bile duct. I always get the question, why do I have to remove part of the intestine? Well, the truth is it's, it's because you want to remove all the lymph nodes around there and also because the blood supply to the head of the pancreas and the first part of the intestine uh, is actually the same. So you, it's very difficult to make the first part of the intestine uh, be viable if, if you don't remove like the entire area. And we, we, when we reconstruct this operation, we have three areas to sew, the stomach to the small bowel, the bile duct to the small bowel, and the pancreas to the small bowel. So when we do a distal pancreatectomy, so you have a tumor in the tail of the pancreas, but it's too large, or it sits on the duct, as I said before, where we can carve it out, but we actually have to remove the entire pancreas, there's two considerations that we have to take. Number one, the blood supply that is shared uh, between the spleen and the tail of the pancreas is quite often the same. So again, I often get the question, well, why do you have to remove my spleen? Why can't you just remove the tail of the pancreas? The reason is, if, since they share the same blood supply, we want to take, um, if, if we take like the tail of the pancreas out, such as here, you know, we often have to take the spleen as well. And, and occasionally we can preserve the spleen, but um, it's also quite common that the lymph nodes uh, that if, if those lymph nodes are involved, they're usually around those vessels, so you really want to take usually the tail of the pancreas and the spleen at the same time. Removing the spleen is not a big problem. We do it all the time. People get into car accidents and get their spleen removed, uh, but you have to be up to date with your vaccination against three bacteria, um, and you have to make sure that you get uh, revaccinated every three to five years. But you can live very well in a normal lifespan without a spleen. Oops, I'm going to go back. Now, this is what I talked to you before. If it's a small neuroendocrine tumor, if there's no distant metastases, if we don't think that there are any, um, any lymph nodes involved, what we can do is we can literally carve these tumors out. This is very specific to neuroendocrine tumors. You can't do that with adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, as I mentioned before. Um, and, um, and, and we scoop these tumors out, but they have to be away from this uh, main duct there because we don't want to put a hole in the duct. See if I can get four. All right, so now the question that uh, surgeons have studied is, of course, does it make sense to carve things out? And is it better from an oncologic perspective if we carve something out versus if we remove an entire piece of the pancreas? And the truth is that for neuroendocrine tumors, it actually doesn't make a difference. The um, operative time is shorter when you carve uh, something out. The risk of a leak is a little higher. Uh, but overall, we do it all the time, and I think if you have a localized small peanut, you could definitely consider to have it 
enucleated. Things that we talk about all the time as surgeons, and that's true for all kinds of surgeries, are we going to do an open operation or a laparoscopic operation? Laparoscopic is keyhole surgery. We could do it with the robot or without the robot. And essentially what we do is we make a, a few tiny like incisions, uh, such as uh, you can see on the left side there or on, on your right side. Um, and we like put a video camera in there, and we can do uh, the surgery with long um, instruments versus an open operation is a bigger incision a little bit of a longer hospital stay because a little bit of uh, more pain management uh, required. But, you know, I would say that uh, either way is an appropriate way. We have done open operation for decades um, and we've become very good at it. Uh, but definitely the laparoscopic way, especially if, if you have a localized tumor to the pancreas, um, is a good way to think about ha um, having surgery in certain centers uh, uh, are really specialized in that. Um, now again, if you have to do multiple organ surgery where you have to take like a piece of the pancreas and you have to take the liver uh, or, or you have to debug the liver, then it gets uh, really difficult and we usually can't do it laparoscopic. We have to do it open. Now complications after pancreatic surgery, I always like to tell my patient two to seven days in the hospital, so about two to 12 weeks for complete recovery. Um, and usually we do place a drain. It's a little thing that just, um, it's a little plastic tube that hangs out of your uh, body and you can like hide it under a shirt. It stays until there's no more um, output or uh, if you don't have a leak, it, it comes out before you go home. Complications. Delayed gastric emptying is one of the complications, uh, which means your stomach can sometimes take a little bit of time until it wakes up again. A leak, you can go to any uh, surgeon you want to go to. If a surgeon tells you, I can do pancreas surgery without any leak, he's lying to you. Um, you can be as good as you want to be. The truth is it's always going to be about a 30% pancreatic leak rate, which come back to the first thing I said is the pancreas doesn't like to be operated on. We always learned this as residents, and it's still true nowadays. Um, and then bleeding and infections are relatively rare. One last or two last thing I quickly want to mention, which I think is interesting because we're changing on how we're managing some of these pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. That comes back to what Thor has said uh, in the last few minutes of his talk. Well, um, we are um, actually becoming less and less aggressive at resecting small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that are less than two centimeters. These are the ENETS guidelines and the NANETS guidelines um, um, are going to come out very shortly. But essentially, when a tumor is two centimeter or less, there, uh, you can have a serious consideration. And of course, if there's no distant metastasis, so you have to get a proper workup to make sure the tumor hasn't spread. But if it's two centimeter or less and it hasn't spread, then, um, then there's definitely um, uh, uh, a potential for not doing an operation and just observing these tumors. Um, I give you an example here. This is a CT scan, and you see this tiny little tumor, 1.4 centimeters. It sits right in the head of the pancreas. Sure, we could carve it out, no question, but any surgery has risks, and sometimes we don't have to be super aggressive with these tumors as long as they are well differentiated and they are small. So what we do with those tumors is we follow them over time, and many studies have shown that uh, most patients actually uh, do not experience a growth in these tumors, depending on what studies you believe in. It's anywhere from zero to 50%, but the truth is probably around 20 to 25% of patients will experience growth over time, and the other ones won't. And so not everybody has to um, undergo surgery if they have a small localized pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And it's non-functioning, I have to add that on. So meaning if it's not secreting hormones, usually if it's uh, secreting hormones, we actually do want to remove it. And then lastly, one, uh, two few last slides, is, is there a role to resect the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor uh, primary when there are distant metastases or liver metastases that we can't surgically remove? Does that make sense? And that's a controversial subject uh, when, when we talk about, um, about the medical versus surgical community and like expertise. But there has been some data suggesting that um, here, for example, uh, looking at um, about 6,000 patients, of which uh, roughly 500 had surgery, that those patients actually do live longer if you resect the primary tumor, even if you can't take out the liver metastases. And this is another, um, um, another slide showing the same thing. So that's some uh, food for thought. So um, that's my talk about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and surgery. I'm going to um, introduce uh, Jim Howe, who is a professor of surgery at the University of Iowa. Um, he did his uh, residency um, 
and his, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, his residency at WashU and his uh, fellowship at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. He's obviously very well known in the neuroendocrine tumor community. He's one of my mentors, and I'm very happy that he's here today to talk to us about small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Thank you for coming, Jim. All right, thank you very much, uh, Xavier. That was a great talk on pancreas and Thor. I really enjoyed your picture of the bear for a high grade neuroendocrine tumor. It's nice. Okay, so it's, right now we're going to talk about small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, as you've seen already, the incidence of these tumors has increased significantly over the last three decades. In uh, 1973, there were about two cases per million, and that, now it's up to about 12 cases per million. And we don't really know why this is happening. Um, probably one of the, the most uh, common reasons is that people are getting a lot of CAT scans done for a variety of reasons. You come in the emergency room, you get a CAT scan if you have any abdominal pain, and that's how uh, a lot of people are presenting. So that's probably the biggest explanation, but there may be other things in the environment that are causing this too, That, but we don't really know what they are. I personally think it has to do with cell phones and uh, the internet going through our bodies, but there's no evidence, so it's speculation. Um, so with pe people with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors generally present 29% uh, of the time with localized disease. What that means, it's in the small bowel only and not lymph nodes. 41% um, have uh, lymph node metastasis, referred to as regional disease, and then about 30% have distant disease. And this is based on a national database called SEER. Now, people will see a lot of these tumors in, uh, like Dr. Koikin and myself, will we'll see a slightly skewed population at the University of Iowa, the patients I see, 85% of them have positive lymph nodes, and 70 to 80% have liver metastases. And that's probably because the earlier tumors are being taken care of at community hospitals, and we're seeing the ones that are more advanced. Um, now, as far as how people do with these tumors, they do pretty well. Um, some people, as, as you know, have called neuroendocrine tumors uh, cancer in slow motion. I don't think that's exactly true, but people live a long time with these tumors relative to a lot of other cancers. So if your disease is localized, the median survival, what that means is half the people live more and half the people live less than that, uh, and that number would be 170 months from, again, a national database. If your regional lymph nodes are involved, then the survival is about 145 months, which is quite a while. And then if you have liver or distant metastases, it decreases to 70 months. Um, and again, that's just a median. Again, half of the people are living longer and half the people are living shorter. But for metastatic disease to the liver, that's a long time relative to, say, pancreas cancer, adenocarcinoma that uh, Xavier was talking about, or even colon cancer or, or gastric cancer. Now, small bowel primaries are the most common GI site of neuroendocrine tumors. And the incidence, as we said, is about 12 per million. And about half of these are multicentric. What that means is there's more than one tumor in the small intestine. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, they tend to be well differentiated. And Thor kind of gave you that. I don't remember what the first animal was, whether that was a sloth and then the second was a grizzly bear. So most of them are sloths, I guess. Uh, and even though they are sloth-like, they often present with metastatic disease. They, that's what we mean by presenting late. You know, you've had a lot of disease develop before you go to the emergency room with that abdominal pain, you get a CT scan that shows liver metastases or mesenteric metastases. Now, uh, as was mentioned earlier, some patients will show up with carcinoid syndrome, and that's because these tumors make vasoactive amines, and those are things like serotonin or histamine, bradykinin, and these cause symptoms of flushing in about 94% of patients, uh, diarrhea in about three quarters of patients, valvular disease, this is a little overestimated. I would say it's closer to 10%, and then some people get asthma-type symptoms. And these symptoms will usually only happen in people who have disease that spread to the liver. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, but the reason for that is that if you have a small bowel tumor or lymph nodes that are making these substances, 
when those substances get to the liver, it'll uh, break them down and you won't get the symptoms. But when the, there are tumors in the liver, they will secrete these substances directly into the bloodstream and they won't be broken down. And that's what leads to this syndrome. And as Thor mentioned, there are the five E's that bring this out. You can, uh, it can happen uh, by eating, epinephrine or adrenaline release, emotion, ethanol or having a glass of wine is a good way to test if somebody has flushing, uh, and finally exercise. So some people who have carcinoid syndrome, these things will bring it about. Now the workup for patients with this, uh, with uh, small bowel neuroendocrine tumors usually begins with a careful history and physical, and on the history we're asking questions about bowel function, do you have diarrhea, do you have flushing, do you have abdominal cramps or pain? Uh, have you had a history of jaundice? Um, uh, and then uh, on physical exam, we're looking for signs of bowel distension, an enlarged liver, flushing on the face, uh, and signs of uh, right-sided heart failure. We'll do certain blood tests, and Thor mentioned that none of them were very good. We tend to follow these as a trend, and, and again, with a grain of salt, because there are things that will throw these blood tests off, but we follow the chromogranin, serotonin, and pancreastatin. A lot of other places follow 5-HIA levels, either in the urine or the plasma, and those are uh, generally what we, we use. Imaging, you know, the single most valuable test for us is a CAT scan that shows the small bowel fairly well, although most lesions will not be detected because they're very small. But nearby, you'll often see enlarged lymph nodes that are evident on CT scan, and then if patients have liver metastases, we can see those as well. Um, an MRI is a little bit better if you want to characterize what's going on in the liver. And if you really want to see the whole body, getting a DOTA PET scan is a great way to see the whole body. Um, so for assessing for distant disease, or if you want to give somebody peptide radioreceptor therapy, then getting a DOTA PET scan can be very valuable. Uh, endoscopy is not so good for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. And that's because endoscopy is pretty good at looking at the stomach and the duodenum. Uh, but the small intestine goes for about 15 feet after the duodenum, and the scopes aren't generally long enough to look down there. Uh, by colonoscopy, you can get through the colon, but then you'll often just see the very end of the small intestine. And, and even though many of the tumors can be in that spot, uh, a lot of them are just a little bit further upstream and will be missed. There are some special endoscopy tests uh, where they use a really long scope that they can kind of telescope through the bowel. Um, but I would submit that many of those tests are not really necessary because you can really, if you have a high suspicion, you can find these tumors with your fingers if you're a surgeon. So those endoscopy is not particularly valuable. Uh, this is a picture of a CAT scan. And what you see here is, is basically a cross section. Imagine the feet are coming out this way and the head is that way and we've taken a slice you can see the pelvic bone so this is kind of low in the abdomen and what we see on this is a mass in the small intestine this is a pretty big mass shown in blue the intestine is this area that's dark that's air in the intestine and then this is the mass if we look at a different cut we can see some adjacent enlarged lymph nodes with a little fleck of calcium that's pretty characteristic of these lymph nodes in these patients and then if we look at a lower cut in the pelvis, we can see markedly thickened intestine. This is the wall of the intestine. The normal wall is only about that thick. And this is because there's obstruction of the bowel and there's venous congestion and the blood's not getting out very well. If you take this patient to the operating room, you'll see something like this. This is what the normal small intestine looks like. These black stitches are multiple different small carcinoid tumors. And this intestine is what we saw on the CAT scan, markedly thickened, looks very sick. And when you go down a little further in the intestine, you can see that there's an obstructing or narrowing lesion. This is a hard, almost calcified mass that's constricting the intestine, so it's very difficult for stuff to move through. And that leads to this intestine upstream getting very large because it's having a hard time pushing stuff through there. And that leads to crampy abdominal pain uh, in patients. So the tumors usually start in the wall of the small intestine, and the next place they go is up the regional lymphatics. And those lymphatics are 
basically channels that drain lymph into lymph nodes, which are sitting along these major blood vessels. We call this yellow part the mesentery, and that's how the blood flow gets to the intestine. And what we want to do with these tumors, we want to resect that part of the small intestine and the involved lymph nodes up to here, but we have to preserve the main blood vessels going to the rest of the intestine. So you want to go up as high as you can so you get all these lymph nodes, and then you take a section of bowel and then hook it back up again. Now sometimes those lymph nodes continue to travel up. So those, what I'm talking about is they can travel up here and completely surround the main artery and vein leading down to the intestine. And this is a CAT scan picture of just that situation where the superior mesenteric vein shown here and the superior mesenteric artery shown here are completely encased by a bunch of lymph nodes here. And that's a very difficult situation because these really important arteries and veins are running through a very big calcified mass that's fibrotic and very difficult to remove. And sometimes these cannot really safely be removed. Fortunately, people can live a long time even with that, but sometimes it'll lead to clotting of the vein that goes up to the liver. But usually the body can develop collateral drainage patterns where people can still get along okay. Um, so when we do an operation, what we start with is an incision in the abdomen, and this incision is often in the midline, and it can be very small or it can be very long, depending about whether we have to do surgery on the liver or if they have peritoneal metastases, which are little spots of tumor all around the abdomen, then we often have to go down to the pelvis as well, and that might require a long incision. When you get into the intestine or get into the abdomen, the first thing we want to do is pull out the intestine and just carefully feel it between our fingers. And even a small one to two millimeter tumor we can find. The fingers are very sensitive and you, it's really important to feel all 15 feet of the small bowel because as we said, over half of the people have more than one tumor and if you only find one and leave two or three in there, they're gonna have a problem down the road. This just shows palpating the bowel, and what you see here is, I don't know how well you can project it, it projects, but this is a little, what's called a Meckel's diverticulum, and this is a higher power view, and you can see that in this intestine that there's a small tumor right here, and this tumor is about the size of a pea, but this patient also has a liver metastasis that's about this big, and one of the things that you'll often see is that tumors can be very small in the small bowel, and they won't be seen on imaging tests, but they can have really big lymph nodes and really a large number of liver metastases from that very small tumor. So if the tumor is over here in the small bowel, we're going to remove a section here with the lymph nodes up to here. The majority of tumors tend to cluster at the end of the small intestine. And here you have to take out what's called the ileocolic artery, which also supplies this part of the colon. So when you take out tumors in the end of the small intestine, you usually have to take part of the colon because you're taking its blood supply in order to get those lymph nodes. And this just shows dividing of the intestine here in here, and then dividing the mesentery up to the uh, origin of that artery, making sure they get the last lymph node up there and kind of pulling it down and then ligating that artery, tying it off, but maintaining the blood flow to the rest of the intestine. And then after we take out that section, we hook up the bowel, we use a stapling device, we make a couple holes in the intestine and bring this mechanical stapler which will lay down a line of staples and connect the insides of this part of the intestine to that part of the intestine. And that leaves a little bit of a hole on the end which we close with another stapler and then we bring the mesentery back together here. Now in a study that we did recently, we kind of looked at what we try to do at each operation is feel the entire small bowel, and we like to record where the tumors were. And in a group of a few, uh, over 100 patients, this was the distribution of tumors, starting at the beginning of the intestine and then going 500 centimeters, which is about 15 feet towards the, the uh, colon. And they, the majority cluster at the end of the small intestine. We only had one that was way up high in the jejunum. Now, these are patients who had one tumor, but over half, 55%, had more than one tumor. And this shows the number of tumors that people had. The largest number we saw was 129, and they span from about here to there. And when you have 
129 tumors or eight tumors, then the bowel resection you do, you have to, you know, kind of tailor it to uh, that person, the distribution of their lesions. Because if they're really close together, you can just do one resection, and you'd really ideally not like to resect multiple loops of bowel if you can help it. So a lot of people do laparoscopy for these tumors, and the pros of doing a laparoscopic or the keyhole surgery that Dr. Koiken was talking about is that it's less invasive, patients recover more quickly when they have a small incision, and you can identify the lesions. If they're large, you can see them through the scope fairly well. Um, you can also perform a bowel and node resection this way, and you can do a cholecystectomy, and we'll talk about the, why that's valuable. But there's some cons for doing it laparoscopically. And the main one is that if you patients have multiple tumors and you're not palpating the bowel with your fingertips, then you can miss additional tumors. When you do things laparoscopically, you use these metal graspers that you put through these holes, and you can't really feel these things with the same sensitivity as you can with your finger. So most people who do this laparoscopically will make a small incision and pull out the bowel and make sure they feel it. And that's an important thing to do. Um, but even if you do it laparoscopically, you have to make an incision to, to pull the bowel out and then do the anastomosis. So you're getting an incision anyway. Um, and it's hard to do challenging node resections. And it's probably easier to do the cholecystectomy if you do it open. Um, this just shows that you can actually do a pretty significant bowel resection through a small incision. This is just a small intestine pulled out of a patient through a small incision. You can see these multiple stitches. There are nine different tumors here that we could feel by palpation. This just shows us joining the bowel up together with this stapling device that I showed you in that picture earlier. And in the end, the incision is pretty small. This is about the same size that you would end up if it was done laparoscopically, except you'd have multiple other incisions for the scope and the camera. So this is not easy to do through a small incision like that, but it is, certainly is possible. And again, the key is to feel the entire small intestine to make sure you're not leaving tumors behind. Now, should you take out the gallbladder? That's a cholecystectomy. Um, there are a couple reasons to do this when you do have a small bowel tumor removed. One is that if you're going to be on somatostatin analogs like sandostatin or uh, lanreotide, over time you'll get gallstones. So you might need to have your gallbladder out later on. So if somebody's in there doing this operation, it's not a bad idea to take out the gallbladder. We do it pretty routinely. Unless the patient has very early stage disease and they're not going to be on somatostatin analogs. Second, if somebody has liver metastases and they have embolization of the liver, then sometimes the little particles used for embolization can block off the artery going to the gallbladder and it can die. But in a study from Sweden, when they looked at patients who didn't have their gallbladder removed, only about a quarter of them actually had to have a second operation. So it's not absolutely necessary, but we do it routinely in patients with advanced disease. Uh, the overall survival of our patients is uh, in a study from about five or six years ago is shown in blue. Uh, and we had a five-year survival about 79%. The 10-year survival was about 57%. And the median survival was not reached in this group, whereas in the national database, it's about 88 months. But their patient population only had 34% of people that had liver metastases, while we had liver metastases seen in 81% of our patients, so a very uh, higher stage group. So um, that's sort of uh, uh, our institutional numbers. So our approach to small bowel neuroendocrine tumors is to take out the primary tumor in the intestine, make sure you try to get the regional lymph nodes, debulk peritoneal lesions if they're present, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but a lot of people who have tumors that invade all the way through the small bowel wall will spit off cells that will later grow elsewhere in the abdominal cavity. And even though it's very difficult to remove these in their entirety, trying to remove the bulk of these would be helpful. Uh, we like to remove the gallbladder, and Dr. Koiken will later talk about cytoreduction of liver tumors. We'll do that as well when, when it's feasible. And finally, if patients have advanced disease, we'll place them on somatostatin analogs and then progress to PRRT or everolimus if the tumors start to uh, grow in size with that somatostatin analog therapy or the uh, new tumors start appearing. 
So I just want to thank the group for their attention.